Hi everyone, we are going to go into chapter eight, which is the peripheral and autonomic nervous system. I'm gonna switch to screen sharing with you, and there we go. Um, this lecture is building on top of what we did last week with chapter seven and the central nervous system. So now we're just expanding the nervous system into more of its um, applications. We learned about the brain and spinal cord, a little bit about cranial nerves. Now we're taking it outside of the brain and spinal cord. So here's some learning objectives. They're listed for you in your chapter folder or weekly folder. And um, last week, as I mentioned, we were focusing on the central nervous system and its role in processing the sensory information and then responding usually with a motor or efferent response. Now we're gonna look at that peripheral nervous system, the PNS, which is made of a network of peripheral nerves it's divided into the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves, and we're going to start looking at these as we go. The cranial nerves, of course, are branching right off of the brain, and the spinal nerves are branching off of the spinal cord. So uh, let's talk about spinal nerve structure. You'll, you may recall, sorry, my coffee just spilled. Um, you may recall that the um, structure of the brain had uh, special neurons, usually they were multipolar neurons, and those multipolar neurons were typically myelinated, and we're going to see a similar pattern here in the peripheral nervous system, except there are also um, layers of connective tissue around our nerve fibers. So uh, there is something called an epineurium. This may remind you of the epimesium, which surrounds the muscle cells. Uh, this is an outer covering, and again, it's a dense network of collagen fibers surrounding a nerve cell or a nerve bundle, depending on you know, which nerve or which group of nerves you're referring to. Then there's a perineurium, which is um, basically the same idea as a perimesium, where we have bundles of muscle fibers. You're gonna have bundles of axons here. They're arranged into fascicles as well. And then the endoneurium, which is lining individual axons, covering individual axons. So here you see this process, and you can tell the difference um, between the endoneurium and the myelinated axons, uh, or the myelin sheath, I should say, because again, the myelination is spaced out in nodes and internodes, and that endoneurium is a continuous connective tissue covering, isolating that particular neuron from another neuron because you don't want the wrong ones to fire. You want that action potential to be isolated to just one particular cell. So let's talk about spinal nerves. Um, they branch into something called a rami, or a ramus is singular. There's a dorsal ramus. This dorsal ramus is innervating the muscles, the joints, and the um, skin that's on your back. Then the ventral is innervating lateral and anterior trunk and limbs. The thoracic and upper lumbar segment are carrying motor output of the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. This is our fight or flight response. So in that thoracic and upper lumbar segment, you have motor output being carried in those rami. Here you see what we're talking about. This is the ventral root. The ventral root is carrying out our motor commands. Our dorsal root is bringing in all of our sensory information, and uh, they fuse together to form the spinal nerve, and then the spinal nerves are branching into either the sympathetic ganglia on the thoracic and lumbar segments, or the dorsal ramus going to the back, or the ventral ramus going anterior and lateral. So something called a dermatome is a specific region of your skin that's monitored by a single pair of, of spinal nerves. The boundaries can overlap in some cases. Um, in other words, um, this would be how you can um, di be, be diagnosed with specific nerve damage. They could also do, and I, and I think you might do this experiment in lab, where you have like a needle or something sharp, and you are seeing how far apart those pinpricks have to be in order for you to feel two of them. On something like the palms of your hands, uh, these are very, very uh, close together. You have lots and lots of nerves in your hand. So in other words, your two point thresholds pretty close together. But on like the back of your arm, your two point threshold is very far apart. It's harder to distinguish two individual 
sensations if it's the sing it's if it's just one nerve fiber that's innervating that particular area. So um, that's what a dermatome is all about. And uh, let's talk about shingles for a minute. This is a viral infection that affects your dorsal root ganglia. Remember, your dorsal root ganglia is the bundle of sensory nerve fibers that are within your um, spinal spinal cord. It's caused by the same herpes virus as chickenpox. So if you've had chickenpox, um, most of us who are over 30, I'm in that category, um, you had chickenpox growing up as a child. Um, younger than 20, usually it's like younger than 25 or 26. That's when they started to vaccinate children against um, chickenpox. So I know my, my kids have had their chickenpox vaccine. So they probably will not ever get chicken pox and then they won't have a chance of developing shingles later in life. Uh, but if you had have, have had the chicken pox, then you may develop shingles later because that virus can remain dormant. It's basically attacking the neurons uh, within the dorsal roots of your spinal nerves and it produces a very painful rash, blisters on your skin. Um, and usually those, those rashes and blisters are associated with particular dermatomes that are associated with particular spinal nerves. So. Uh, there you see, they're all kind of like in a line. You can pause the video here and go back and review if you need to. Let's talk about the cranial nerves. There's 12 pairs of them. They're in pairs because uh, our brain has hemispheric lateralization, which means whatever's on one side is on the other side. And so if you have a cranial nerve coming off of one area of the medulla oblongata, then on the other side of the medulla oblongata, you're going to have the other pair. Um, they can be sensory, they can be special sensory, they can be motor, or they can be a mixture of all of those. So the name of the cranial nerve is usually specific to what it looks like or the function of it. And there's also a Roman numeral, and that is corresponding to where it is on the brain. So it starts higher up. So cranial, number one, cranial nerve number one is the most superior um, cranial nerve, and then cranial nerve number 12 is the lowest. Let's talk, let's look at these. Um, it is up to your lab instructor if she is going to have you know how to identify them on a brain. Um, what do you need to know for me for this part of the class? Pretty much everything on this diagram here. You need to know the name of the cranial nerve, the number of the cranial nerve, and what it does. So um, you don't have to know the pathway. You don't have to know where it comes off of the brain for me. Again, I'm never gonna give you a diagram on any of my tests or quizzes but your lab instructor may. So uh, let's go through them quickly. The olfactory nerve is a special sensory and it goes to your olfactory epithelium. That's cranial nerve number one. Cranial nerve number two is your optic nerve. This is a special sensory. It's going to your eye, specifically the retina of your eye for light detection. The ocular motor nerve is number three. This is a motor cranial nerve and it's basically um, innervating your extrinsic eye muscles so that you can move your eyes around. So there are, there's your uh, olfactory nerve, and again, this is the most superior or anterior as well, and then two, and then three. You'll see them um, coming off. The trochlear nerve is number four. This is also one that's innervating your eye. It's a motor nerve um, in, innervating the muscles of your eye, helping to move that superior oblique muscle. The trigeminal nerve is a mixed sensory and motor nerve. Um, it's Sensory is for parts of the face and the lips, uh, as well as your tongue, and its motor function has to do with chewing, mastication. Um, abducens is cranial nerve number six. That is a motor nerve innervating one of your lateral uh, rectus eye muscles for your eye. There they are. Again, branching off of our brain. The facial nerve is number seven. It's mixed sensory and motor. Uh, sensory going from the tongue, motor going to facial expression, salivary glands, etc. The vestibular cochlear is number eight. This is special sensory with hearing and balance. Glossopharyngeal is number nine. This is mixed sensory and motor. It is your tongue and your palate in terms of sensory. And then it uh, is motor when it comes to the pharyngeal muscles, the muscles in your throat, and the salivary gland. There they are. Vestibular cochlear also pharyngeal, and vagus is number 10. It's mixed, sensory, and motor. Sensory is going down into your visceral organs, so all the way down into your thorax and abdomen, and um, it's motor. It's also innervating your pharyngeal muscles and your visceral organs, so all of the commands that um, are controlling digestion are all done through the vagus nerve. 
The accessory nerve is number 11. This is a strictly motor nerve. It's going to the muscles of the palate, the throat, um, the sternocleidomastoid, which is our big neck rotator, um, and the trapezius muscle on the back. And then finally, number 12, the hypoglossal nerve is our tongue muscles. This is how you know how to move your tongue as you speak or chew. There they are. You can pause the video, go back and review the cranial muscles, or cranial nerves, yeah, or cranial muscles. That would be interesting. Uh, let's talk about a nerve plexus. There are four major plexuses. These are basically interwoven networks of nerves. They um, result from basically kind of grouping muscles and nerves together. So it kind of makes sense with what they're called um, because they are innervating the areas that they branch off from. So the cervical plexus, you can see, are coming off of the cervical uh, region of our spinal cord, right underneath the cervical vertebrae. The brachial plexus is just below that, and then the lumbar plexus and sacral plexus are the more. What are you doing back there? My dog. Um, let's talk about the cervical plexus. This is C1 through C5. I see you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it has the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is innervating the diaphragm. The diaphragm is our breathing muscle. So the cervical plexus is really important because that is helping um, with our respiration. Okay, Lily, go lay down. Go lay down. Sorry. I don't know why she's this excited, but she is. There they are. <clears throat> the brachial plexus is just uh, inferior to our cervical plexus. This is our pectoral girdle, our upper limbs. Lumbar is going into the pectoral girdle, or the pelvic girdle, and lower limbs, and the sacral plexus is uh, pelvic girdle and lower limbs as well. That's, that's pretty much all you need to know about the plexuses. It's not, not too complex. All right, um, that's just showing you specific nerves. The nerves are named after typically the bones or the muscles that they're near um, and or the regions of the body. So once you know the bones and the muscles and the regions, you pretty much know the nerves, like the radial nerve, the ulnar nerve, the brachial nerve. They're all just named after where they are. Um, again, in this class, I'm not going to give you a diagram to have you label the nerves, but your lab instructor may. You can pause the video, go back and review the plexuses. Let's talk about sensory pathways. There are several sensory pathways that bring information into the brain. These, uh, the posterior column pathway, and again, posterior column is referring to that part of the spinal cord. If you remember, the white matter is arranged into columns, so we're talking about that posterior column on the spinal cord. This is where our fine touch, vibration, proprioception in terms of body position, all going up to the primary sensory cortex of our brain. So you have something called a first order neuron. This is getting the information from the receptor. So when you are touching, I'm touching my cup, when you touch your cup, you feel that it's hard or hot or whatever, that first order neuron is taking that information, um, it's, it's the fir first neuron to, to receive that information. Typically, it's intercepting um, or synapsing, I should say, with a second order neuron. That second order neuron is typically located in the spinal cord, or sometimes it's the brainstem, uh, like the medulla oblongata, but typically it's the spinal cord. So that information comes in, synapses with a second order neuron, and then usually will cross over. Remember that lateralization, everything crosses over in the brain. So I'm feeling the cup with my left hand, but it's the right side of my brain that's interpreting that and sensing that. The third order neuron is taking that information from the thalamus. Remember, all the sensory information is processed in the thalamus. Taking that information from the thalamus up to that primary sensory cortex so that I can feel that my coffee cup is hard or hot or whatever. There they are. This is the drawing for all of you visual people. Again, you see this is the cross-section of the spinal cord. We're talking about posterior column pathway. So we're on the dorsal side. Comes in, here's our cell body of our first order sensory neuron in that dorsal root ganglion. That axon myelinated, right, because it's white matter, goes right on up, crosses over, um, typically in the brainstem or in the lower uh, upper parts of the spinal cord, like um, just below the medulla oblongata. Crosses over, goes up, synapses with the third order neuron in the thalamus and then can go up to that primary sensory cortex. There's also the corticospinal pathway. This is control over spinal muscles, or skeletal muscles, I should say. Spinal muscles, there's no such thing. Um, there's an upper motor neuron associated with this. This is the, has a cell body within the central nervous system. 
uh, typically the primary motor cortex, and that's going to communicate with the lower motor neurons. The lower motor neuron is going to leave the brain or spinal cord and go out to the spinal skeletal muscles, not spinal muscles. Um, so again, the axons here are crossing over, so the information that's coming from the right side is going to cross over in the brainstem or spinal cord and go to that left side of the body. Here you see that corticospinal pathway. You have all of this um, motor uh, information coming from your primary motor cortex, and it's going down through your brainstem and crossing over somewhere around your medulla oblongata and leaving out that ventral root to go to the skeletal muscles. So typically all of this is the upper motor neuron and then the lower motor neuron is what it's synapsing with in that, um, in the spinal cord. A homunculus, and you probably saw that term here, homunculus, it's kind of a cool thing, uh, is basically a map of your brain. It's usually, it, it's a map on the primary sensory and primary motor cortex. Um, so the sensory homunculus is on the primary sensory cortex and it's basically reflecting the relative proportions of sensory receptors to each region of the body. And same thing with the motor cortex. The, um, it's on the primary motor cortex, the, the motor homunculus, and um, it's, again, proportional to the um, innervation. Let's take a look back at the sensory or motor homunculus here, and you see it, it looks kind of weird. There's a small foot and a small leg but a very big hand, a pretty big mouth, big tongue, and a throat. So what this means is look at all the sensory um, motor commands that are involved with your hand, your face, and your tongue compared to your foot. Right? The foot's relatively small. And that's all the homunculus is. It's just a proportional view of how many motor neurons there are associated with every part of the body. And I can flip back a few slides and look at the same thing with the sensory homunculus. Again. Not that many of gen genitals involved here, um, but you also have a little bit more in the feet because you know you're you're feeling things with your feet, you're stepping with your feet, etc. Um, you have your hand, which is relatively larger than like your arm, your face, lips, mouth are much bigger. Teeth, tongue are also included in the sensory homunculus. So it's just a a uh, way to kind of map out how many sensory and motor neurons are associated with each area of the body. You can pause the video, go back and answer these three questions. Let's keep moving and flex, um, moving and shaking with reflexes. Um, these are rapid automatic responses to a specific stimuli. So typically they are providing a very rapid adjustment to some type of um, situation. So there's a reflex arc that's involved in reflexes. So you have first a receptor. The receptor is just like any sensory receptor, it's receiving the input. You touch a hot stove, and those thermoreceptors in your fingers are sensing that it's hot. So that, that is part of the sensory neuron. So there, there's a receptor, to, a thermoreceptor, and that sends a signal to the sensory neuron saying, hey, we're touching something very, very hot. That sensory neuron takes the information up to an information processing center. Typically, in a reflex, it's in the spinal cord. So that information processing center is usually an interneuron, and it is just going to, instead of sending that information all the way up to the brain, because it's a reflex, we need it to happen quickly, that interneuron is just going to relay right over to a motor neuron, which is going to respond with some type of effector, like flexing your bicep and getting your hand off that hot stove. So there's one um, example, it's called the stretch reflex. This is the simple and fastest of all of our reflex arts. The patellar reflex is an example of this. So the receptor is when you tap the patellar tendon with a hammer. The receptors in the quadriceps muscle are stretched. And the sensory neuron senses that stretching, and so it carries that information all the way up to the motor neuron, where there's information processing taking place, and that motor neuron says, whoa, we need to um, extend. So that motor neuron takes the information back to the effector, and the quadriceps muscle is contracted and your leg is then extended. That's why you kick out your leg when that patellar tendon is touched. And here you see the, the process. Typically, there's usually an interneuron in, in between that sensory and motor. This drawing doesn't show that, but that's okay. Uh, there's a reflex arc. 
Uh, with the reflex arc, you, um, or with the withdrawal reflex, I should say, it's a little bit more uh, complex. The withdrawal reflex is like the hot, touching a hot stove. So you have that receptor, the sensory neuron, and here's where you have that interneuron coming into play. It's this little kind of mini neuron that relays the information from the sensory neuron to the motor neuron. So it's the same thing, it's just involving an extra neuron. And this extra neuron synapses with the motor, with the sensory neuron and the motor neuron, and it also communicates that information to the brain so that you are now aware that you touched a hot stove. So you can pause the video here, go back and answer these three questions. I'm gonna take a sip of my coffee. Because obviously I need it, I keep misspeaking. Sorry about that. All right, let's talk about some tests. Um, your uh, reflexes can be used as diagnostics. Um, they're very important in um, determining your proper brain functions, nerve function, um, and information processing. So uh, activities that are going on in your brain can actually inhibit or facilitate those reflexes. In other words, if I say, okay, I'm going to test your patellar tender, patellar tendon reflex, I need more coffee. Um, you might say, okay, I I'm supposed to kick my leg out. And as soon as I tap your patellar tendon, you're going to kick your foot out, right? Because that's what you are supposed to do. Or you can say, you know what? I'm not going to kick my foot out. I don't want to. And so it doesn't matter how hard I hit your patellar tendon, your brain is consciously inhibiting that action, which is why typically doctors, physicians, clinicians, when they are testing your reflexes, they don't even tell you that they're doing it. They just quick pop you real quick and just check it. So um, the biceps reflex, there's a triceps reflex, and there's also an ankle jerk reflex. Uh, the biceps reflex is the same idea. You touch that um, tendon there and your um, arm flexes. Triceps reflex is the same thing, just on the back of the arm and you're extending. Same thing with ankle. You hit the back of your ankle, and your toes go into um, plantar flexion. The Babinski uh, reflex is a um, special diagnostic reflex. In infants, when you stroke the foot on the lateral side, uh, the toes spread out. It's called the Babinski sign. Um, but as your motor pathways begin to develop, that reflex is inhibited. So in normal adults, stroking that lateral side of the sole is going to um, result in the curling of the toes instead of the spreading apart of the toes. That's the plantar reflex. So if an adult is spreading their toes when you touch the side of their foot, that may indicate some type of brain damage to this or, or general damage to the central nervous system. So reflexes can be diagnostic. There's also an abdominal reflex. Um, our descending motor tracts can facilitate reflexes within our ab abdomen. Um, stroking of the abdominal muscles will produce a twitch, um, and the absence of the reflex may actually indicate some type of damage to the descending tracts. So this is the abdominal reflex. And this is just a chart showing general reflexes and how they're used in diagnostics. You don't have to have this memorized. You just need to know what a reflex is and how it works. You can pause the video, go back and answer these three questions. Let's talk about referred pain. Referred pain is when you are hurting, but it's a different part of your body that you're experiencing the pain. So it's a sensation of the pain in part of the body other than the actual source. And this is a big example of this is heart attack. Most people, when they're suffering a heart attack, don't feel it in their heart or chest. They're feeling it on their left shoulder, down their left arm. Uh, visceral pain sensations can do the same thing. Uh, they can stimulate interneurons that are part of the spinothalamic pathway um, and go up to the primary sensory cortex so the pain is felt on a specific part of the body surface. Um, an example of this would be gallbladder pain. If you've ever had a gallbladder attack or you know someone that has, Ask them where it hurts. At first, they'll tell you it hurts right under the rib cage, and then they might tell you it hurts on the back of their right shoulder. Kind of strange. But that's because that's where those neurons are, and they're misfiring and hitting the sensory nerve fibers of the spinothalamic pathway to um, tell you that your back is hurting, your, the skin, the, your, um, your shoulder, the back of your shoulder is hurting. That's the guy with his heart attack. What is that's an awfully interesting computer thing he has there. 
just notice that. <laughs> um, Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is uh, where the neurons that are within the substantia nigra can be damaged or they're secreting less dopamine. So your basal nuclei are becoming more active. Remember, basal nuclei are those background patterns of movement like walking, walking upstairs, running, right? Things that you don't have, that you initially have to learn that you don't have to learn anymore. So this is also going to raise your skeletal muscle tone, producing very rigid, stiff joints. Um, so you have difficult starting and stopping voluntary movements, like getting up from a chair, walking, etc. This is why people with Parkinson's have kind of a shuffling gait. They shuffle along a little bit um, instead of walking, picking their feet up. Um, and this is, again, just showing you that substantia nigra and how it has diminished any Parkinson's patient. Rabies is another um, disorder that affects our nervous system. It's caused by a virus. The virus actually goes into the axon terminals and travels from the terminals along the central nervous system. Toxins like heavy metals like lead, and some pathogenic bacteria, other viruses can enter the same pathway, which is why they have uh, detrimental effects. There's rabies going into our body. Cerebral palsy is another one. The number of, um, it, it's kind of a general term uh, to describe a number of disorders that affect our voluntary motor performance. The symptoms of this are typically appeared very early in life, infancy, early childhood, and the symptoms will persist throughout life. Typically can be caused by trauma, premature or stressful birth, uh, maternal exposure to drugs, uh, or it could be a genetic defect. So it's a, a wide range of causes cerebral palsy. ALS, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This is uh, progressive, very degenerative, and it's affecting the motor neurons of spinal, brainstem, cerebral hemispheres. All of our major nerves are affected by this upper and lower motor neurons. Underlying defect could possibly be axonal transport, meaning um, the uh, vesicles that are holding neurotransmitters are not releasing as they need to. Um, so overall destruction of central nervous system can cause atrophy. Everything starts to shrivel up. Muscles um, are going to start losing their muscle mass and tone because they're not getting stimulated like they need to. Lou Gehrig's disease, right? Uh, Alzheimer's disease is another progressive disorder. This is typically loss of higher order cerebral functions, thinking, memory, logic, etc. It's the most common cause of dementia or loss of senility uh, in elderly. Symptoms usually appear between age 50 and 60. Sometimes they um, can appear later on in life, and they can occasionally affect younger people. 15% of those over 65 will have some form of dementia. Very sad. Um, causes 100,000 deaths per year, and typically it's resulting from abnormalities in brain regions that are associated with memory processing. Um, if you've ever known anyone with, with Alzheimer's disease, they start doing strange things uh, like putting their keys in the icebox or uh, forgetting how to make mashed potatoes or something like that. Uh, and those are usually the early signs that something's not right and um, it can exist for years and years or it can go downhill very quickly. Again, it's, it's all kind of relative to the individual, um, but it's very sad to see someone go through this disorder. There they are. Uh, Alzheimer's typically, uh, what happens is the accents get uh, tangled together, and so these tangles are misfiring and uh, resulting in the confusion. MS, multiple sclerosis, is a recurrent demyelination. Um, so the axons are slowly losing their myelin, and so the processing is slower. The action potentials are traveling slower. Um, typically, the axons that are affected are the optic nerve, the brain, the spinal cord. Symptoms include partial loss of vision, problem of speech, balance and general motor coordination, dropping things, tripping, etc. Um, the time in between instances can vary. There are um, varying degrees of uh, the disease, and usually they're progressive. So once someone starts showing symptoms, it's going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. Or sometimes it could be um, the type of effect where you have good days and bad days, where you have good weeks and bad weeks. So um, again, it, it's another one that kind of varies from individual to individual. It typically occurs more in women than in men. 
You can pause the video, go back and answer these questions. Let's talk about the somatic nervous system. This is our conscious control over our skeletal muscles. This can also be subconscious in the forms of some of those reflexes. The lower motor neurons are typically controlled by the reflexes. Upper motor neurons are controlled from the brain. There they are. Um, you can see these lower motor neurons synapsing from the upper motor neurons of the brain. The autonomic nervous system controls our visceral functions. These are the things that are outside of our awareness. They have integrative centers in the hypothalamus. If you remember the function of the hypothalamus, it's there for all of our things from emotion to eating to um, sex drive and all of, all of those um, kind of subconscious activities. Um, so it only makes sense that it's coming from the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is also heavily involved in our hormones. So again, hormones play a huge role in all of those activities as well. And here's where we introduce a single lower motor neuron, but there's two motor neurons in, a, in the series. There's something called a preganglionic neuron. These are the cell bodies that are within the brainstem or the spinal cord. They're part of a visceral reflex arc, and they are communicating with the ganglionic neurons. The ganglionic neurons are uh, visceral motor neurons within the periphery. So these are the ones that are actually going to the peripheral visceral effectors, going into the organs, going into the heart, going into the smooth muscle or the adipose tissue. So here you see what I mean. Here are the visceral motor um, neurons that are our are, are upper motor neurons in the thalamus, our hypothalamus, synapsing in, in the brainstem or in the spinal cord. Then they synapse with what's called a preganglionic neuron. And then somewhere outside of the brain, outside of the central nervous system, they synapse again with our visceral effectors, or with our ganglionic neurons, I should say. And those ganglionic neurons are going to the visceral effectors. They're going to the smooth muscle, to the gland tissue, to the adipose tissue, to the cardiac muscle, etc. So in the sympathetic division, those preganglionic neurons are coming from the thoracic and lumbar segments of the spinal cord. The ganglionic neurons are then located within something called a sympathetic chain ganglia or a collateral ganglia or something called the adrenal medulla. So here you see what I mean. Again, all this is coming from the hypothalamus, those upper motor neurons, then they're synapsing down here to our uh, preganglionic neurons, leaving the spinal cord through the thoracic and lumbar segments going to the ganglionic neurons, which are either in what's called the sympathetic chain ganglia, the collateral ganglia, or the adrenal medulla. Then they synapse with those um, post-ganglionic fibers going to the visceral effectors, going to uh, the actual organs themselves. Maybe it's the heart, maybe it's the lungs, maybe it's the stomach, the liver, etc. So uh, short preganglionic fibers are uh, typ typical of the sympathetic activation, typical of sympathetic um, nervous system. So that fight or flight response typically has short preganglionic fibers and they're releasing acetylcholine. The long po postganglionic fibers are releasing norepinephrine. So that's their specific neurotransmitters. Again, sympathetic is that fight or flight response. So this is heightened mental awareness. This is when our um, metab metabolism kind of goes up, you're like, what, it, what was that sound? I'm a little scared. Your heart rate goes up. Respiration goes up. Digestion, urinary, all that goes down. Res respiration rate goes up. Uh, dilation of your bronchioles increases. Heart rate, blood pressure goes up. You might start sweating a little bit. You get sweaty palms. You know, right before the airplane takes off, and you get sweaty a little bit, and your heart rate goes up. Right? That's all sympathetic activation. Parasympathetic is different. The preganglionic neurons could come from cranial nerves, cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10, or the sacral segments of our spinal cord. Typically, they're synapsing with 6 to 8 ganglionic neurons, so this has a more widespread uh, innervation. They could be found in what's called a terminal ganglia or an intramural ganglia. The terminal ganglia are typically very, very close to the organ, the intramural data, uh, ganglia are actually embedded in the organ. So both pre- and post-ganglionic uh, axons in the parasympathetic are releasing acetylcholine. Here you see what I mean. Come, oh, again, it, it's all coming from the upper motor uh, neurons of the hypothalamus going down to the pre-ganglionic neurons 
of um, the brainstem or sacral segments. Um, specifically, these are the cranial nerves. And going to the ganglionic neurons, intramural ganglia or terminal ganglia, and then the target tissues. Parasympathetic is the opposite of sympathetic. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. This is why after you eat a big meal, you're kind of sleepy. You have a decreased metabolic rate. Heart rate goes down. Blood pressure goes down. Salivation, digestive juices start flowing. Increased motility and blood flow all go to the digestive tract, and uh, urination and defecation are usually stimulated as well. You can pause the video here, go back, and answer these three questions. Let's talk about some patterns within the autonomic nervous system. So both sympathetic and parasympathetic can innervate the same structures. Um, so the sympathetic division has something called splanchnic nerves and sympathetic nerves. The splanchnic nerves are bundles of preganglionic fibers um, within the co uh, collateral ganglia. The sympathetic nerves are bundles of postganglionic fibers that go out through this uh, thoracic cavity. So here you see the splanchnic nerves. And the sympathetic nerves are up here, going into the thoracic cavity, like the heart and the lungs. And you can see what we mean by the chain ganglia. They kind of form this chain right outside of the spinal cord. So innervation in this parasympathetic division is mostly done through the vagus nerve and pelvic nerves. The vagus nerve is 75% of all the parasympathetic output. So if you get a question about which nerve is parasympathetic, it, it, just say vagus, because vagus is pretty much what they all what it is. It's cranial nerve number 10. Numerous branches are intermingling as well with the sympathetic fibers, so there's lots of interaction between sympathetic and parasympathetic. The pelvic nerves are um, basically innervated by the intramural ganglia coming from the walls of the kidney, the bladder, the intestines. There you see pelvic nerves going out to kidney, bladder, um, sex organs, and here you see the majority of our parasympathetic is coming directly from cranial nerve 10, that's our vagus nerve going through heart, lung, digestive. You can pause the video, go back and review. Finally, functions of the parasympathetic and sympathetic division. Sympathetic, the whole idea behind sympathetic um, division is fight or flight, get out of here, let's go fast, I need to survive. Parasympathetic is slow changes, they don't undergo division-wide activation, it's just a case-by-case -case basis, they don't release neurotransmitters directly into the bloodstream. Sympathetic is putting your whole body on alert. Parasympathetic is just kind of like a case-by-case -case basis. Whatever organ needs it, it activates, etc. It's not, it's not a do or die response like the sympathetic is. These are just general comparisons between sympathetic and parasympathetic. The parasympathetic preganglionic uh, and sympathetic preganglionic are both located in, this, in the central nervous system in the brain or spinal cord. Again, parasympathetic, remember, it's mostly our, our cranial nerves. And they go out and synapse with our uh, sympathetic, uh, with our ganglionic neurons. The ganglionic neurons of sympathetic typically are longer. Then in our parasympathetic, parasympathetic, they tend to either be right next to the target organ or within the target organ themselves. And remember, the sympathetic is using acetylcholine in the um, synapse between the pre-ganglionic uh, and ganglionic, and then it's using norepinephrine from the ganglionic to the target. And parasympathetic is only using acetylcholine. But this chart here goes through all of the differences, but pretty much what I said is all you need to know. Don't get too bogged down in all of the nitty gritty. Here's some review questions. Let me know what questions you have. It's a pretty um, complex chapter because it's a lot of uh, c concepts that you can't really see. Um, it's, it's just a, a lot of kind of big abstract concepts. So I want to make sure that you understand what they are. So again, please let me know and ask questions. And um, good luck. See ya.